The last two years have been uh, very much a roller coaster. It's a really interesting time to to win the Nobel Prize during 2020 because the world's upside down anyway. So the fact that your life is being turned upside down <laughs> through the Nobel uh, Prize is uh, just one further uh, way in which I guess the bottle gets shaken. Um, it was. Uh, it's been. It's been interesting to try to understand how to. Um, take advantage of the opportunities that it presents and also understand the responsibilities that it, I think it really demands. Um, so it's been two years of trying to figure out in some sense how to wear the mantle of being a Nobel laureate. Um, and in some sense doing this during COVID has also been a, an opportunity to do this very calmly. Um, because you can do a lot of Zoom talks and, and think a little bit more thoughtfully about, um, or maybe calmly, uh, about what to do next. You know, it's interesting to think about what br brings um, you to science, because it's, it's, it's super easy to tell a story that makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't feel that linear when you're going through it. So the story I like to tell, because it makes sense, is um, I was four years old when the moon landing first happened, and I got super excited um, and intrigued by the idea of the universe. I mean, the universe is immense, both in terms of space and time, and that can be both awe-inspiring and frightening at the same time. So I think this is, as a kid, something that really intrigued me. Uh, but at the same time, I also wanted to be a ballerina, so um, not so clear. But I was really good at math and science as a kid, and I just view it as uh, one giant puzzle. Uh, so it's sort of problem solving, and I've always enjoyed enjoyed that kind of analytic um, thinking. Um, so so that. That, that path to you know, taking one step forward and trying to figure out, well, is that the one that feels right? Um, and then making your next decision from there, yeah. Oh, I've had so many different role models along the way. I mean, so many people, we are all so influenced by our families and our, t our, our teachers. So I, I'm very fortunate. I, I come from a family um, that, um, from whom I'm, I, I've learned a lot. I, uh, my father was a professor of economics, um, so very much an academic, so I learned the world of academia. And his brother was actually a physicist, and they used to love during family holidays, um, uh, when we got together, to, to figure out um, how the ancient Greeks figured out things. So I grew up with this, um, you know, the, the, this, this, this pair that just loved thinking deeply and uh, about how people figured things out. Uh, so I think that that always really intrigued me. The uh, and then I, my mother is a director of a contemporary art gallery. Um, so she um, she uh, is very much a leader and uh, and uh, she very much inspired me. In school, I've had tons of um, really wonderful teachers, including a high school teacher, uh, Mrs. Keene. And in fact, I've said that in an earlier interview. And during this week, I met a Nobel laureate's daughter who was also inspired by Mrs. Keene. Uh, so we took a picture uh, to send to her. Um, uh, and then in, in uh, college, I um, had a fabulous mentor, um, Professor Hale Brott, who got me into research, um, gave me wonderful opportunities and really encouraged me um, to explore many options in the research world. And then I guess you know, the final mentor was my PhD advisor, um, Gary Neugebauer, who um, you know really demanded um, a level of scientific integrity, I would say, and um, uh, and to, to, it really taught me to respect the data, not, not to necessarily go after the, the story, but to really understand what, um, what data, the data we're showing you. Oh, I take very seriously the role of um, being a role model for the next generation of scientists. I think in particular, um, being the fourth woman to win the Nobel Prize, I take this very seriously. I've always felt um, very committed uh, about inspiring the next generation of scientists, particularly young girls, um, through being visible. And the way I've 
for years decided to do this is to teach always at the introductory level, uh, uh, college introductory classes, because that allows you to reach the most number of people, both the um, young men and the young women, to show that there's a diversity of scientists um, out there. I'm not an expert in the world of, <laughs> of what it means, you know, gender studies around science, but I can share with them um, how exciting it is to be a scientist uh, and the work that I do, yeah. I think my favorite way to give advice is to share that I think it's useful to think about um, your what you're what you're going to do next um, in th on, uh, in three sections. One is to really understand what you love and to continue along that journey of what you know and understand that you have passion for. And then second, to, to always take the risk to explore new things, new, new things that might, you, might make you un, a little uncomfortable, take you out of a equilibrium, because if you haven't tried something, you don't know whether or not you like it or not. So that's the second piece. And then the last piece is um, to think about how you can give back, how you can help the next generation um, have the opportunity to discover what they um, have passion for. The question of what um, environments help you be creative is a, is a really interesting one um, because we live in a world that um, is so overwhelming um, in terms of um, the, the constant demand for our attention, both uh, abstractly and also quite um, literally. And you, you really need, um, actually this is gonna sound contradictory, um, you need both the quiet to think um, and I personally love, um, I love to swim. Uh, I love to swim because you cannot have access to your cell phone. <laughs> and it is quite literally very quiet. And it lets your brain um, relax to not think directly about what you're, um, you're struggling with or trying to work out. It's the idea of, you know, get your best ideas in the shower. So for me, it's in the pool. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important is to um, have the opportunity to talk to people. Um, talk to people about um, either what you're, you're working on or what they're working on. Um, it, it's almost like the space for a really deep conversation um, as opposed to the only in the meeting, uh, only for a few minutes, or only via Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> which is an awful way uh, or an awful space. I mean, it's great for getting things done in the sort of literal sense, but in terms of that creative space of, um, of understanding how you might think about a problem. So I, I'd say having a, a group of people who are um, really smart around you and who have expertise in different areas is also a really big piece of how do you get your next ideas. It's such an interesting question to ask can you identify moments of discovery, especially for a very long-term project? And in the case of um, the work that I've done, um, it's, it's gone, it, it kind of has been steps. Um, and those steps often correspond to um, technological development. So where you can get to with today's technology. And then you'll um, uh, get to the next level of technological advancement. And then you um, mine the science or, or, um, from, from that level. So in, in the case of the study of the center of the galaxy, it's really gone in almost four steps. And each one I can identify some piece. I'd say um, the, the, well, actually, it's sort of funny. You, 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 I, can, I can identify so many different pieces. Maybe some of my f favorites are, um, we actually had a hard time getting this project going. Um, the telescope uh, proposal um, to do this project was turned down. And in fact, it was a, such a, it was even only just that first little piece we were trying to get going. So it was a project to go for three years and it was turned down uh, and, and the telescope was new. It wasn't clear that what we were proposing was going to work. So it, you know, it makes sense that people were skepti skeptical, but it was so exciting just to get to the telescope and, and, and see the first image that showed this is really going to work. And in fact, uh, I didn't think of this when I started answering this question, but it just occurred to me that the artifact I gave to the Nobel Museum this week, I started off with the thought, well, let's give them the uh, first data tape that stored the first measurement because that kind of represented both the, yeah, it got started and it was hard to get started, but also the issue of 
preservation of data. And then I thought, oh, well, let's go find the log sheet that goes along with this first measurement. And I, I just have to say, I laughed so hard when I saw this, um, the log sheet, because it was handwritten. And in the comment um, side, for the first frame, there's a little comment in the side that says, holy shit, <laughs> because we were so taken aback by how, um, how great the data looked. <laughs> <laughs> it was clear that you know the, the project was really going to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was fun. It was fun. So that was that was a moment, a moment that you can see, clearly see the the record of. Um, and then of course along the way, it just kept getting better and better, um, and you start to realize, oh, like you can get so much more out of this um, experiment, and that's where we still are today. We we're reali uh, we've realized, oh, we can make the next um, push forward. Um, so it's. Sometimes there's moments, and sometimes it's just uh, it's it's gradual, and it would be hard to to identify the moment. So the question of um, what inspires me, uh, I think it's really when things don't make sense, um, when you get some new piece of information and it doesn't form, um, conform to your previous ideas, and it really forces you to rethink. Um, um, your model for describing how things work. For me, that is the most interesting moment. Um, I, I remember some, somebody interviewing me once and was so surprised that I seemed most excited when we were confused. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is true because if you predict something and you measure it and it's exactly what you predicted, I mean, that's satisfying, but also doesn't lead to, to the next step. Um, so it, it, to me, it's more interesting when things don't work. Um, and technology is just evolving so, so quickly. So you know that if you keep pushing on that front, um, without a doubt, when you look with really new ability to see, it gives you a really new perspective, you're without a doubt going to land in this re uh, regime where, you, where things don't make sense. I think scientists should be very involved around the ethical debates um, around what we do. Uh, we're responsible for introducing new capabilities. Um, and of course, you don't always understand, I mean, speaking generally, um, what the utility is. I mean, that's the nature of basic research, um, is that you do it because you're curious and you don't always understand what the long-term applications are going to be, many of which can be really good and exciting, and many can be complicated. Um, and we can't stop progress. Um, so, but it is, it is um, on us to, to participate uh, in the discussion of how it gets used. I think diversity in science is, is really important. I mean, at, its, at the heart, there's diversity of thinking. Um, people have all, come from all different backgrounds and bring um, different um, training and ideas and backgrounds. And science really benefits from different voices at the table. Um, so you can talk about that in terms of gender, you can talk about that in terms of ethnicity, but you can also talk about that in terms of your scientific training, your understanding. And the more open we are to new ideas, I think the better our science uh, is at the end of the day. I think having role, strong role models is really important um, to show the uh, to depict scientists in the in the with the breadth uh, uh, of forms that they can take, and, and I mean that in a lot of different ways. Actually, I, mean, I feel very grateful that my parents um, really encouraged me and gave me um, biographies of Marie Curie and Amelia Earhart, and these biographies really inspired me. <clears throat> I also think that uh, the um, being in an environment where you're being provided with, with these um, role models is really important. For me, also later, I mean, the, the question of diversity is different, um, has different issues at different points. Um, I think that um, I'd say for me personally, the presence of a really strong daycare system uh, uni uh, within the university system has been essential. I mean, one, because it just conveys right at the get-go, we care and expect you to be able to handle this. So that's a really important message. And then two, because it brings together a community of people who are trying to figure out how to do this ban balancing act. And there's nothing, about, nothing like having a community of people who can problem solve. <laughs> and then long-term, 
long after your kids are outside of a daycare system. Um, the university has created this network of people from very diverse um, areas um, that are really well connected. And those connections actually help you be effective uh, for a very long time. So I think those, you know, at, at the end of the day, facilitating, um, and then at the beginning, um, role models.